Well, we continue on with our lectures on what happens when a star gets close to the end of life. Now, what we discussed before in the first lecture on this series was the death of a low mass star, like the sun or even lower mass. And we basically said what was the problem is that when we look at the distribution of gases within a star, first born, the uniformity is relatively uh, given from the very center of the star all the way out to the edge of the star. But as time goes on, more and more, uh, and more of the hydrogen gas has been converted into helium. And uh, what really signals the death of a star is the simple fact that the fuel is not sufficient within the core of a star to maintain the structure and the dynamics that have been going on as a main sequence star. So what we always know, what we stated several times in the last lecture is generally what happens is that in a dying star, the fuel is used up. And of course the fuel is hydrogen, which is a proton, a plus charge. And so what happens then is the core cools, the core collapses, then the core heats from gravitational energy. So if I asked you on the final midterm in the class next week, why is it that a collapsing core heats up? is from the gravitational energy of basically collapsing down, being converted into kinetic energy, then into thermal energy, heating the core up. And we've talked about this multiple times. As the core heats up, it basically has to heat and heat and heat. And as it does so, a shell outside the old core gets hotter and hotter and gets above 10 million Kelvin. And this starts the proton-proton chain. So that's the old thermonuclear action. Now, the rate of this is much higher than it was in a main sequence star. So the rate of energy production is greater than when the star was main sequence. And there's a reason why. For a low mass star, basically the top energy of a star like our own was about 15 million Kelvin. But the inner core, that old core with a lot of, of helium there, basically just gets collapsed more and more and more, collapses down, and produces the uh, you know hotter and hotter temperatures until finally the outer core gets hot oh, excuse me outer shell of new gas outside the old core gets hot enough to produce energy from the proton proton chain protons four of them converted to one uh, helium atom but the temperature of that outer shell now gets hotter and hotter and hotter and can get much more hotter than the old core of the main sequence star. In other words, much greater than 15 million Kelvin. And so that means the energy is formed greater and greater. Then what happens is the core hits three, uh, 100 million Kelvin. And that triggers the triple alpha process. 
and that's where three helium produces in a and it speaks about the process in the book but well I care that you remember three helium eventually yields a carbon plus energy and so generally speaking then what happens is what this says is three helium atoms interact in a nuclear way to produce one carbon atom a bigger atom so lighter atoms making bigger atoms which means this is a fission process just like the proton proton chain is plus energy that means that plus sign means energy is given into the environment shines and so all throughout this process the outer parts of the star is being pressed bigger and bigger and bigger so basically what happens is the star gets much larger gets brighter because there's more surface area so I'll say it again it gets brighter because there's more surface area in this dying red giant star and so in this process right through here becomes the red giant which is very big <clears throat> and it gets brighter because of that but the uh, the surf of us, uh, surface of it gets cooler here for a reddish in coloration and the reason why it's cooler is there's more surface area for the energy to flow out and it's farther away from the atomic core the nuclear core that's going on in the car in the star and we talked about the helium flash where for a few hours the helium burns quickly to carbon and then it settles down after a few hours and this you know lasts for a shorter period of time as a fuel than you know the protons were for the proton proton chain every new fuel lasts a shorter time than the previous fuel Re remember that if I asked you on the exam what's true about every new fuel well number one is that it is the product coming out of the previous thermonuclear process so basically you know in the proton proton chain it produces helium helium then became the new fuel for the next process the triple alpha and then it's carbon after that would be the next fuel and so forth <clears throat> excuse me and then it starts over you know carbon builds up in the core the core cools cools collapses then heats from that gravitational energy for a low mass star what we said is that generally what occurs is in or order for carbon to be a fuel the temperature for carbon to be a fuel must reach roughly 600 million Kelvin in the core huge temperature and that's not going to happen so you get this carbon core getting hotter and hotter and hotter you have a region outside that's getting hotter and hotter and hotter too and so this this star gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally what happens is the outer parts the envelope of gases that are not a part of the core are basically pushed into space by interstellar burps of this dying star spreads out and dis uh, disappears through the interstellar medium in the form of a planetary nebula and the reason why it was really called a planetary nebula it was kind of spherical looking so people can imagine it's a planet but of course as we get better and better detail now we see there's shells of gas being burped off this old dying star but there's a problem for a low mass star the max temperature so T max of the core for a low mass star is only about 300 million Kelvin and so that's why this you know internal part just never can use carbon as a fuel and so we got this 
core that's primarily carbon. We've got the outer envelope of gases being pushed out in, in the form of a planetary nebula. And so what we have here is a star that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Sorry. Come on. As the hydrostatic equilibrium is out of balance. And eventually what happens is because that inner core cannot use carbon as a fuel, it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So as it says, we have a helium burning shell outside of that. And that opens up a whole new shell in a new region of the star to produce the proton-proton chain to eventually push the outer envelopes out to produce this planetary nebula and that inner region <clears throat> with that little white guy called a white dwarf. And that's the resultant death of a star like ours. So if you see, here is it's kind of right there. It's the helium flash. It kind of settles down, kind of gets a little smaller, less bright, a little hotter on the surface though. And then it uses up the fuel of the, of the helium and then it begins to expand because it gets hotter. And then right in this region, the planetary nebula is thrown off and the core lands up right here. So I've asked you, what's in the lower left corner of the HR diagram? White dwarfs, not stars. They're the first stellar remnant left behind. The brightest star visible in the night sky anywhere seen from the Earth with the naked eye is the, is the star uh, Sirius in the constellation of Orion, uh, excuse me, not Orion, but right next to Orion, called Can uh, Canis Major. I'll say it again. Sirius is the brightest star visible in the night sky. It's in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog constellation, very close to Orion. And it's a really bright blue star. You can't see this with your naked eye, but with a telescope, you can identify that there's actually a little dot next to it, and that is a white dwarf, which is kind of exciting. <clears throat> and so just to give you some ideas about this, the mass is actually greater than the mass of our sun. It's very is only eight thousandths of the size of our of our sun, which is about the size of the Earth. Very uh, the luminosity is not huge. The surface temperature is great, and the density is tremendous. Three billion uh, kilograms That's, on Earth that would weigh about seven uh, billion tons, excuse me, 7 billion pounds for every cubic meter. But what about big stars, massive stars like blue giants? Now they have a much bigger gravity bank. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Let me do that. So on the death of a high mass star, <clears throat> these are blue stars, blue, blue whitish blue, and such. Their masses are great. So these are really high mass stars. So what that means is that the gravity bank, so the gravity energy bank, the count is large. It turns out that carbon can be a fuel. And so it's uh, used as a fuel. And then it's used up and you know as as each fuel is used in these guys, then as always, 
the core cools, collapses, and heats up. And it keeps collapsing and collapsing, heating up layers above that old core like it did in the low mass stars, producing regions above the old core where the new energy production is formed. And more energy is formed, you know, out of this new fuel. One thing I want you to remember, and so make sure you get this in your notes so you know this. Every new fuel that shows up is the product of the last energy process. So again, you know, when you went to the triple alpha process, it used three helium atoms. That was the old product of the previous fuel process, proton proton chain. Then carbon was the next fuel. Well, that was the product of the old process, which was the triple alpha process, three helium forming carbon. And then carbon goes and produces a, a product, and it becomes the next fuel, and on and on and on. And so what can happen in a highly evolved high mass star, and this, you can see this, see all these different layers right down the core. Now notice most of the stars still the non-burning. Burning is not really the right uh, step way to say this. It's still a non-nuclear region, nuclear process region on the outside. We'll call it burning but it's not a chemical process, it's a nuclear process. Got to be very cautious with the words you use so that there's no mis uh, misunderstanding. And so one thing you notice, it goes, the very outer one is the proton-proton chain. And triple alpha and carbon fusion, the product of that was oxygen fusion and the neon fusion, magnesium, silicon fusion, and so forth. And each one of those fuels shows up, is used as a thermonuclear process, as a new fuel, producing a new product. And in all of these, each new fuel, number one, remember this, is used up much more quickly than the previous fuel. So if I ask you, I have a new fuel that shows up in the core of a high mass star, What's true about how long it can be used? Well, shorter than the previous fuel, okay? I'm not going to ask you any specific ones because you look that stuff up. I'm not interested in your memorizing times. I want you to understand the process. And the reason why they're used up is that, think about again with the proton-proton chain. You have a whole bunch of fuel in the core, but for every atom of fuel, it takes four of those to make one atom of the next fuel. And that's going to happen with the next fuel, the next fuel, so we see less fuel produced. Now, what does this mean? That means the core is getting hotter. After each fuel. And in every one of these fuel cycles, that is a normal fuel cycle that this can use, we have a light atoms forming a bigger atom, and of course that's called fusion, where light atoms combine to make a bigger atom plus energy. That means that energy is, is produced in this process and shines out. Now what happens because as this big star gets further into its death, its, uh, death process, because that core gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and there's all these energy processes, this star can swell up huge to produce a massive star. A star that can not only you know, be out to where the Earth is, but out to where uh, Mars is, or even further. And so these stars are known as red supergiants. And so they're gigantic, and they're red because the outer parts of these are, you know, quite cool. Anytime there's a reddish coloration on the surface of a star, 
then you know it's cooler. But these red giants can be very, very bright. Think of Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a bright star in Orion. It's a red supergiant. And the reason why they're so dang bright is because they're big, more surface area. Surface area and luminosity both, remember, makes a star bright. Remember that. I'm going to say it again. I could ask this on the exam. What makes a star bright? If you have big surface area and large luminosity. So that's what matters. But something happens with these stars. And what it is, is the showing up of that iron ash right there. On the day iron ash shows up is the day the star dies. Because, see, if iron, Fe's iron, tries to produce a bigger atom, what happens because of the quantum nature of, of iron, it's minus energy. This process sucks up energy. So what happens here? Is that, along with the idea that we've used the previous fuel, which was uh, silicon, it's the last fuel. Silicon was a fuel. We use it basically up. Iron's been formed, but from silicon, we're talking now to use iron as a fuel, and everything that happened before happens again, but in a cataclysmic manner. So, what happens here? On a big star, the core cools when iron's formed. So it begins to collapse. And what occurs here is previously what got came from this, the core heats and heats and heats and heats until the new fuel can actually start some type of thermonuclear process. And that halts and stabilizes the star for a while as new energies balance the inward pull of gravity. And it readjusts itself in size and temperature on the surface and internally until that fuel is used up. But iron sucks up energy. Because iron is sucking up energy, this process doesn't get stopped, doesn't stabilize. The core heats up, it heats up, it heats up, it heats up, until finally there's, it's so hot in the core that the gamma rays and the energy of the light is so tremendous that the gamma rays of the light, so the gamma rays from the light of, and energy of the core blasts the iron back into protons and neutrons of the core. In other words, all those millions of years of evolution that the star has gone through, most of it's been in a normal state as a main sequence star, you know, using not the proton-proton chain, but another process called the CNO cycle, carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, which we don't need to go into. Uh, uh, the whole point about that is the same thing happens. Uh, effectively, uh, protons are converted to helium in that process in multiple steps. I've only uh, have really gone through kind of deep, um, more deeply the proton-proton chain at the very beginning of unit uh, one into a little bit more about the triple alpha process, but I'm not going to go that much in the CNO cycle, which is used by big stars. But millions of years have ended up with iron form in the, in the core, and in just a brief moment that iron is blasted back to protons and neutrons. And then guess what? The core 
collapses. Because now there's no fuel at all you know, of any great preponderance in the core to counter gravity. By the way, this process has a name. It's known as photo, that means light, photo disintegration. Make sure you write this down, disintegration. That's where high energy gamma rays blast the nuclei of iron with a whole, uh, whole bunch of uh, protons and neutrons and basically blast them back into just being separate and alone. And the core collapses. And they're collapsing, collapsing, collapsing. And what happens is that there's always a sea of, of electrons that are flying around within stars. They've been forced off their atoms because of the high temperature. And they're just floating around. And for the uh, the book talks about, you know, with for a low mass star, that the white dwarf and the core of this thing stops collapsing because electrons are shoved together. And there's a rule from quantum mechanics that says that like particles can't be shoved too close together. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in conjunction with this. So because of this, what happens is that protons, it's a plus, that's protons, is this plus guy, are shoved together with electrons. What's plus, when you add plus and minus together, you get zero. And out of this comes a neutrons plus nice little things called neutrinos. So this is electrons, this is neutrons, and these are neutrinos. So those little ghost particles that can pass through just about anything. We talked about the missing neutrino problem when we only saw one-third of the number of neutrinos we expected from our sun, and at that point we discovered that there were three types of neutrinos. Go back and review that. But what happens here is neutrinos carry a little bit of energy with them, and they go away so the core cools even more. And this whole thing collapses down even greater and faster. But what's going on now is we have the neutrons that were blasted from the, uh, from the iron and the new pro, uh, neutrons formed out of the protons from the iron and the electrons that are flying around in the star. So you have this core with a lot of neutrons and the neutrons are collapsing down, collapsing down, collapsing down, collapsing down. And it's kind of like marbles in a bag. Imagine, you know, I was a little boy, I loved marbles. And so I would have a bag of marbles. marbles. If I have them spread out in the bag, but then I lift the bag up, it's like the marbles are dim, uh, kind of like the neutrons as they roll down when they get to the bottom of the sack. They can't get any closer, right? So they're kind of stuck there. And so basically what happens is this. Neutrons, like electrons, obey the what's known as the Fermi, that's an R, Fermi exclusion principle, which says that they can't be too close together. So imagine this. You got this core of neutrons collapsing down, collapsing down, collapsing down quickly, and then a whole bunch of mass falling around, dropping on top of the neutrons from the envelope of the star. And this is going quickly. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're dancing, you've got a bunch of people dancing behind you, and if you stop real quick, they're going to run into you. And that's what kind of happens. The neutrons quickly drops down and then just stop because of this poly exclusion principle. Oh, did I say Fermi? Excuse me. I am so sorry. Let me do this correctly, huh? In other words, right. 
And this is the Pauli exclusion principle. Forgive me. Family is another important scientist. But anyway, uh, and I'll refresh this so that we make sure we review this before I let you go. So you got the main thing to know is this. Neutrons are coming down, coming down, coming down. They stop because they're getting too t uh, close because of the Pauli exclusion principle. All the other stuff rushes down, smacks into it, and just rebounds tremendously, powerfully backwards. And when that does that, it utterly blasts this massive star into, uh, you know, just gas and, and basically flying out of it. It utterly destroys the star. And this produces what is known as a type 2 core collapse supernova. Type 2 core collapse supernova utterly destroys a massive star. So let me kind of refresh this. So let's take a moment. You know, big stars have been going through a lot of different fuels. Every fuel lasts a shorter time. Every fuel is the product of the previous fuel cycle. And as it does that, it heats up another and another shell overhead in the old envelope of gases with the new fuel cycle at the bottom and the very top level shell it's always the proton-proton chain or something like that. And every time what happens is that iron basically is formed eventually by silicon fusion. And when that occurs, iron again has a problem. It wants to suck up energy and not emit energy if it goes through a fusion process. So there's nothing that stabilizes this star with a new fuel like it did before. So the core continues to collapse and collapse and collapse, getting hotter and hotter and hotter, producing very, very high energy gamma rays. And those gamma rays basically blast the iron eventually back into protons and neutrons that every nuclei have. Except for maybe standard hydrogen, but don't worry about that. So we got protons and neutrons flying around, but there's also a whole sea of electrons that's found throughout the star. The core is collapsing. And as it collapses, the protons are forced into the electrons, and they produce a neutron because the charges basically uh, cancel one another and releases a neutrino. But unfortunately the neutrino makes things even worse as they fly away because they carry more energy which causes that core to collapse even more. And so the core is collapsing with mainly uh, neutrons. There's still a lot of electrons and still protons and things there but primarily neutrons, and all of a sudden they get to a place where they're so tightly together, according to the rule called the Pauli Exclusion Principle, don't, I made a mistake earlier, please forgive me, the Pauli Exclusion, Pauli was a famous, famous astronomer, uh, physicist that is, and what that says is like particles cannot get too close together. It has to do with quantum mechanics. The science of the very small. And so it's like they just very instantaneously stop collapsing and all the gas that's been following that smack into this and rebound basically blasting that star into smithereens, utterly destroying it, producing what we call a type 2 core collapse supernova. Understand something. This produces the largest explosion found in nature that we see. I mean, these explosions, when we have a core collapse supernova, 
it can produce the same amount of energy as, let's say we take our sun and we add up all the energy it produces in its full lifespan of 10 billion years. Multiply that by 100 times. Another way to say this, it can shine brighter than the galaxy that that star is in, this dying star. Another way to say this, if I could look at the energy of every star that's visible in the universe and add up every one of those stars' energy they produce in one second, that would be equivalent to this explosion. It's a tremendous explosion. Don't want to be close to one of these things, guys. It's called death. In the 1980s, a uh, very strong new, uh, supernova went off halfway across our galaxy. It took 50,000 years for that explosion to reach us. And what it did, it shut down many of our satellites facing toward where that star that died had been. And it ionized our atmosphere. And if that had been closer, uh, it's called death for all life on Earth. We see no star that is close enough that would uh, provide a threat in that manner. Now, just as a note, as these things are happening, right before these things are happening, a uh, supernova star can be very unstable. So before it gets to the point where the iron is, force, uh, is causing this collapse, we can have these huge ejections of energy into space from the star. Very strong, you know, ejection of gas blobs. So if I asked you, what happens before the star dies? What happens is a whole bunch of gas can be emitted. And so when we see this, we're very interested because it means, well, it could die relatively soon. Of course, it could be a thousand years from now or 10,000 years from now. But we watch it because that indicates great instabilities are happening within the core of the star, causing this stuff to happen. And so when they destroy themselves, this is what's left behind, just huge clouds of gas and dust. Just as a note to you guys, <clears throat> the uh, all these PowerPoints are in the... Uh, unit 3 uh, uh, module on Canvas, so you can find that. Now, what's neat is all atoms heavier than iron is formed during this explosion, and it's called nuclear synthesis, meaning the formation of heavy atoms heavier than iron. So. If you have a you know gold watch or a gold ring or a gold necklace or silver, platinum, all these things, uh, these atoms were formed at the death of a massive star. You're you're ho holding the remnants of a death of a massive star. Do you know that? I mean, think about that too. I mean, we're connected to this universe, guys. Imagine this: that the atoms. In our bodies, if we look at all the particles that make up the atoms, all these particles were formed at the origins of the universe, you know, roughly oh, greater than 13 billion years ago. Every one of us. And they combined and come together in different means through the processes of stars. We're old. All of our body parts are billions of years old. And they come together and then they form and they, uh, then they go apart. New things come together, and it's just, you know, the nature of the physical universe around us. I mean, you cannot help but be astounded. Uh, Carl Sagan always said it, and I think he said it in some ways as an acknowledgement of his awe about these ideas, that we are the stuff of stars. We are the stuff of stars. Now, there's one more thing I want to do with this. I'll do this in another uh, next video, is that in these deaths, basically there's uh, stellar remnants. They, these are what are left behind when a star dies. And we've already talked about white dwarfs and planetary nebulae. 
Planetary nebulas are the gas envelope that just basically spreads out in space and eventually dissipates and mingles and mixes within the interstellar medium to one day again maybe produce another planet, maybe produce another one of you, who knows. But we haven't really talked about the stellar remnants left behind by a massive star, so we need to talk about that. And then one last thing. It turns out, you know, I talked about how a white dwarf is like a big cinder. Excuse me, it's like a like a coal, you know, your barbecue. You got the briquette real hot and has been cooking meat and whatever, and then you allow it to cool, and then uh, similar to a white dwarf, it just cools over longer than a billion years. It takes a white dwarf to cool, and it produces what we call a black dwarf, just a cool, cold as space cinder size of the earth where there might be gigantic mountains of diamonds who know because it's crushed carbon in these things but there is another endpoint for some white dwarfs not for our sun because our sun is a star that's by itself it turns out that half the stars if not more probably along the lines of 50 to 60 percent in that range of all the stars overhead these stars are uh, multiple star systems or binary star systems where they were formed together and they actually orbit one another. Sometimes, it's a lot of them times that is, are two stars orbiting one another, sometimes three or more stars orbiting together as a system. And so when a white dwarf happens like that, like we saw that picture of Sirius B orbiting that uh, very, very bright star called Sirius, something really uh, explosive can happen. So guys, I'll stop this video now. I'll post it, and then I'll add another video to end this. And then what's left is I need to talk to you a little bit about galaxies in the Milky Way. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Big Bang. And then I think that's all the lectures we'll have for the semester. What a weird semester, huh, guys? We'll make it. So anyway, talk with you very soon. Bye-bye.